Hi, Dr. Bernard here. In my opinion, the things listed in George Floyd's toxicology report by Hennepin County absolutely do not absolve the officers. The reason I'm bringing up the toxicology report right now in 2020 is because the report is going to get brought up in the trial of the officers. And after digging deeper into the report, it confirms what the video shows, that George Floyd died at the hands of the now former officers. This is an educational video about not just the toxicology report, but also the things that are listed on it. On Memorial Day, May 25th, 2020, George Floyd bought a pack of cigarettes from Cup Foods, East 38th and Chicago Avenue, Minneapolis. It was just before 8 p.m. The employees of the store went to George's vehicle after he made the purchase and asked him to return the cigarettes because they believed that the $20 bill that he used to pay for it was counterfeit. He refused. They called the police. On the 911 call, they reported that George was awfully drunk and not in control of himself. That's not out of the ordinary on Memorial Day weekend, though. On arrival of the police, George was in a vehicle with another person. The police approached and confronted them. An observer sitting behind the car recorded the encounter. It ended with George in handcuffs. He was placed against a wall sitting down. He was then helped up and brought to a police car where, on camera, he stumbles. Police get him back up. More police arrive. As they struggle to get him into the police car, outside observers record four officers huddled over George. This culminated into the knee-on-neck image. Eight minutes and 46 seconds as George pleads to the officer, I can't breathe, as his face becomes purple and he falls unresponsive. This was in addition to a pressing down on George's back and multiple pleas from the observers for the officers to let off. On arrival of the ambulance, video records show an unresponsive George Floyd being put on a stretcher. An hour later, George Floyd was pronounced dead in the emergency room. An autopsy was done by Hennepin County the next day. It's good that the family requested a second independent autopsy, but that second autopsy didn't get a second toxicology report. Although I'm not sure if they could do a repeat one because original samples can degrade over time. There's also some misunderstanding circulating around about this report. The medical examiner said straight up, homicide. He died at the hands of the officer. So let's start from the top. The title reads, Cardiopulmonary Arrest Complicating Law Enforcement Subdual Restraint and Neck Compression. Cardio means heart, pulmonary means lung. Arrest meaning that the system of the heart and lungs has stopped functioning. Cardiopulmonary arrest is not a heart attack. Keep that distinction in mind. Heart attacks are called myocardial infarction, which means heart muscle dead tissue from blockage of blood supply. Cardiopulmonary arrest could be that the heart stops beating, or it could be that the heart something like shakes in place and doesn't actually pump blood anywhere because something is wrong. And in George Floyd's case, something was wrong. How did his cardiopulmonary arrest happen? Nothing traumatic on his back and neck, but trauma here means something of like a high impact, a blunt force, or something like a cut. But we have video evidence of what actually happened. Nothing hit him in a way that could cause a bruise there. He wasn't squeezed by hands as to cause contusions. The officers laid weight on him. They didn't slam it on him, so yeah, you're not going to see bruises. Once the pressure is off, you might not see any marks. And again, it wasn't just his neck. There was someone pressing down on his back too. And not just the back of his legs, the back of his chest. They didn't find a bruise from what happened. They now have someone on their hands who's not alive anymore. Both reports also say that George Floyd had atherosclerosis. This means that the blood vessels that provide blood to his heart were narrowed. A heart attack is when these blood vessels that supply oxygen to the heart get clogged and blocked. This means that oxygen can't get to the heart muscle. Muscles need a lot of energy so that they can contract. Oxygen helps fuel that energy and it provides a way to clear out waste products when that energy is burned. Circulating blood clears all of that out. Without oxygen and without blood flow, muscle tissue can't function, it'll die and that's called a heart attack. The report says that some of Floyd's heart arteries were narrowed by 75 up to 90%. The category for this is severe, but he didn't die from a heart attack. He died from cardiopulmonary arrest. Again, two different things. George Floyd tested positive for coronavirus, once on April 3rd, 2020, and again, post-mortem. But it looks like he was asymptomatic. COVID can cause someone to stop breathing, but he didn't have signs of being sick from COVID. You can have the virus and not be sick, so it doesn't look like that's what caused the cardiopulmonary arrest either. So now we get to the toxicology part. The report says that they got the samples about 30 minutes before the time of death. And what do those results say? 
Well, there's nine compounds that are listed, and this doesn't mean that George Floyd took nine different drugs. Some of these are metabolites. That is, you take something and it gets broken down. So in reality, there's five unique drugs on this list. So let's knock out the easy stuff. Caffeine, I had a cup of coffee this morning. I have caffeine in my blood. Cotinine is a metabolite of nicotine. The man just bought a pack of cigarettes. Cigarettes have nicotine. THC is from pot along with breakdown products. The levels of these are not anything super alarming. So then fentanyl. What is fentanyl? It's a synthetic opioid. If you've heard about the American opioid epidemic, fentanyl is a big contributor. An opioid interacts with the same structures in the body as morphine, which is from opium. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine, meaning you only need one one hundredth of the same dose to get the same effect. I know the autopsy says 80 to 200 times, but the reality is measuring opioid equivalents is hard, and depending on what endpoint you're going to base it off of, the number is going to be different. And what effect do you get from an opioid? Well, they're pain relievers, but at higher doses they cause the rush and euphoria. And just to give you a sense of proportion, Heroin is two times more potent than morphine because these groups let it cross the brain easier. So fentanyl can be 50 times more potent than heroin. All of this means that you take a smaller dose for the same effect. The more potent a medicine, the higher the chance is to accidentally overdose. This is why bad things happen when fentanyl and heroin are mixed together, because if the user doesn't know that the heroin has been mixed, that's going to be an accidental overdose. Now going down the list, norfentanyl is not an additional drug. It's a metabolite of fentanyl, so it's a breakdown product. It's not active. Same with 4-ANPP. Your body breaks drugs down so that it can get rid of them. Drugs don't stay in the body forever, and presence of norfentanyl is actually really important and we're gonna to get to this later. And then methamphetamine. Anyone who's older than 25 right now may have heard of the term speedball. This usually means cocaine and heroin together, but it can be any stimulant, also known as an upper, combined with a sedative, also called a downer. Cocaine is usually the upper, it's a stimulant. Heroin is usually the downer. Famous people who accidentally died from overdose in the 1970s through the 90s often died from speedballs. And how does that work? This brings us to what an opioid overdose does. Being a sedative or a downer means that the opioids cause respiratory depression. It means in large doses, it affects parts of the brain that control the breathing rate. Large enough dose means that you stop breathing altogether. You stop breathing, your heart stops beating, and then it's cardiopulmonary arrest. Do you see how this is gonna get brought up in the case against the former officers? Did George Floyd take enough of a dose to stop breathing? I don't think so, because we see him responsive on camera. If you've seen an opioid overdose, those people are chin to chest nodding off, and that wasn't George as we saw it on video. The way opioids distribute in the body usually peaks fairly quickly, and we have him on camera for some time beforehand. Speedballs in America aren't as common as they were 30 years ago. More common now is the combo of fentanyl and methamphetamine. They're called goofballs. There's probably other names for it now, but goof is because meth causes more cognitive changes than cocaine, despite both of them being stimulants. So why is this combo more popular now? Well, heroin is made from morphine. To get morphine, you have to grow plants. You don't need to do any of that with fentanyl. It's lab made. That lab is quicker and you don't have to take time to grow anything. It's cheaper, quicker to make, and 50 times more potent. The numbers show that fentanyl is now more common in the United States than 10 years ago, whether users like it or not. And meth really never went away. We all heard about it in the mid-2000s, about it being cooked up in some farmhouses in the Midwest. These underground cooks would use the cold medicine Sudafed, which has pseudoephedrine to help make it. Once states started monitoring all pseudoephedrine sold at pharmacies, it kind of phased out production in the Midwest, and now it gets shipped in. So what does this have to do with George Floyd? Well, one of the points that's been coming out about his autopsy is the 11 nanogram per milliliter level in his blood. Nanogram per milliliter is a concentration unit. So for any volume of blood that's pulled, find the mass of fentanyl in it. There's people saying this level is potentially lethal and they're right. But remember, opioid overdose causes someone to stop breathing. For the other drugs, nothing appears to be extraordinarily high. How did George Floyd's cardiopulmonary arrest happen? It's because he couldn't breathe. So some might try to frame it that the fentanyl alone 
caused him to stop breathing independent of having a knee and somebody's body weight pushing down on his neck and back. But no, that's not right. Fentanyl alone didn't cause him to stop breathing. And here's why. George Floyd was a big guy. The report says he was 6 feet 4 inches tall, but other sources say he was 6 feet 6 inches tall. He was 223 pounds, and either way, he wasn't obese by body mass index, and he was close to his ideal body weight, which is calculated from his height. So he likely didn't have a lot of excess fat tissue on him. This brings us to an idea called lipophilicity. Lipo meaning fat and philic meaning affinity for. Fentanyl is lipophilic, meaning that it dissolves in fat. What does that mean? Within five minutes of entering the bloodstream, 80% of the fentanyl dose leaves the blood and enters the organs. After this, the fentanyl will distribute from the organs into fat tissue where it slowly releases back into blood. If George Floyd wasn't obese, then he might not have as much fat tissue holding on to fentanyl. This could mean that he'd have a higher level in his blood compared to someone who has more fat tissue. One study that looks back at 500 fatal fentanyl overdoses in 2016 New Hampshire shows fentanyl levels in the blood had a range from 0.75 to 113 nanograms per milliliter with an average of around 10. That's a wide range. Other studies have shown a little bit higher of an average, around 18 nanograms per milliliter. Keep in mind those are the averages. I saw some people confuse the word mean, which also means average, with median. They're different values. And also you're gonna see ranges. This is retrospective data. It's looking back in time. You can't control for all variables, all other things equal. So it's subject to selection bias. You're not wrong if you say that the level is elevated and within range of some of these studies, but you're also not looking at the video evidence that George Floyd wasn't nodding off on fentanyl. Some of these studies didn't divide up the data to account for things like body weight and obesity, which would affect how fentanyl is distributed in the body. Remember, it's lipophilic. They didn't account for male or female. Men have more water in their body as a percentage than women. Elderly have a higher body fat percentage than the young, on average. Did the study divide the data based on kidney function, which decreases generally as you get older? Kidneys are important for urinating out the breakdown products of drugs. Liver function can also get worse if you have prior disease. Patients who have opioid use disorder are at risk of hepatitis because things like needle sharing might happen. And the liver is what breaks down fentanyl. So without controlling for these, you might get a wide range of values in the study and between studies. Where did they pull the sample? And when did they pull the sample? If it was a long time after the overdose and the person had a lot of fat tissue on them, these are all details that may change the measurements from one person to another. So this brings us back to the original description. On the 911 call, the store owners reported that George was awfully drunk and not in control of himself. He wasn't unconscious. He wasn't nodding off on video. He didn't have his chin to his chest and turn cold like one would from an opioid overdose. In medicine, you have to look at the patient after you read a lab number. 11 nanograms per milliliter is in the average reported in some of these studies. It may be high, but maybe not for George Floyd. Again, he's not knocked unconscious in the early parts of the video record before he's on the ground. Hard to see, but he doesn't look like he's asphyxiated before he's on the ground either. He can respond to commands. He can stand up. He can talk and plead to the officers that he can't breathe. So he's oriented and he knows that he's on the ground. So yes, assuming the Hennepin County report is verifiable, George Floyd did have fentanyl in his blood. It was around the average level reported in retrospective overdosing data. But observing him, he was responsive. He was able to follow commands. He was oriented and had nothing additional happen to him after 8 p.m. on Monday, May 25th, 2020. The total amount of fentanyl in his body wouldn't have increased on its own. The levels would only go down because the body is breaking it down nor fentanyl's presence makes that known. The report says that the measurement was taken just after 9 p.m., which is more than an hour after the encounter started. Without an increase in fentanyl levels from taking another dose, which he couldn't have after the encounter started, it's very unlikely that he would have died from fentanyl alone. And speaking of norfentanyl, there's one more reason why its presence is important. 
Fentanyl can cause something called wooden chest syndrome. Sometimes it's called chest wall rigidity. It's important that people know this because it's one of the reasons why opioid epidemic is so terrible. Opioids cause respiratory depression, but fentanyl is unique in that it doesn't just cause respiratory depression, it also tightens up the respiratory muscles. It can compromise the airway by tensing up the muscles, and it can do this at any dose. We know this because they use fentanyl in the operating room. And sometimes fentanyl will cause someone to stop breathing. Because the muscles are so tight and tense, doctors will have trouble ventilating the patient. They try to push pressure through the chest, but the muscles are so rigid that air has trouble going in and the person suffocates. So how does wooden chest happen? Well, if it's affecting the muscles, then it might be acting on the nerves which send signals to the muscles. In the synapse, where the nerves connect to the muscles, chemicals are used to send signals. In this case, the chemical that we're focused on is called norepinephrine. When the signal is done, that synapse needs to clear itself so that the signals aren't sent nonstop. This means that those chemicals need to be pumped back in or broken down. It looks like fentanyl stops the synapse from getting cleared. This means that the signals are sent nonstop, continuously stimulating the nerve and not letting the respiratory muscles relax. But do you know what else causes the release of this norepinephrine? Methamphetamine. That's exactly how meth works, meaning that taking both fentanyl and methamphetamine together could increase the chances that someone can not only stop breathing, but that they couldn't even be ventilated even if they wanted to be, which is why goofball needs its own distinction as specifically fentanyl in meth, separate from the generic speedball. But it's important because wooden chest did not happen to George Floyd. And here's why. When wooden chest happens, it looks like it appears so quickly after dosing that many times the body didn't even have time to break down fentanyl before the person dies. Remember, fentanyl leaves the blood quickly to go into the organs and then into fat and muscle. The nerves are made of around 60% fat, so easy target for fentanyl. This means if wooden chest happened to him, he might not have had nor fentanyl present in his blood, but he did. And that means that that wooden chest likely didn't happen. So why couldn't George Floyd breathe? It's not because of wooden chest. The fentanyl alone, in my opinion, didn't do it either. The fentanyl and methamphetamine combo negated some of the effects of each other as their opposites, but they also elevated the toxicity of each other. The lab numbers are in range, but remember, look at the patient. The man was responsive. He was oriented. He was not nodding off putting him in a compromising position on the floor, pressing body weight down on his back and neck while he's stressed due to a confrontational situation which would increase his need for oxygen were the cause of death. So again, I bring this up because I see some misunderstanding online about the report. I had to step back and look a little bit deeper myself because the pivot of heroin to fentanyl has happened so quickly in the US over the last five years. I put the references in the description below, but please keep in mind if you want to read them, they sit inside a clinical and scientific conversation that needs some background context to understand. And clinical context, like looking at the patient after reading a lab number, is not something that you look up online as obvious as doing it sounds. It's one of the first things that students miss. All of this is going to get brought up in the charges against the former officer, so we have to make sure that the record is clear. There might be more information to come out later, I don't know, but the video from May 25th, 2020 speaks for itself. George Floyd shouldn't have been put into that position to begin with and for that long, regardless of whatever can be found in his blood by a lab test. None of this should have happened, and I hope we never have to see anything like this ever again. And I think we should all work together to make sure that something like this never happens again. So take care of yourself. Thank you so much for watching. Be kind to one another, and be well.